So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the Bible. And to make a list of what all the Bible means to us and what all the Bible does to us and for us would be a list longer than we can make. It is your word. It is a never uh, boring, never irrelevant message from your heart and mind to us. We pray tonight we will hear your message. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 31. <clears throat> Jeremiah has been very, very strong in his declaration of judgment upon a disobedient people. <clears throat> God never judges a people unless they deserve it. If they deserve it, he will judge them. Uh, every good parent will not overlook a disciplinary situation in a child, but for the good of the child, will will discipline that child for their good, that they will learn truths that they would not learn otherwise. And so he's been very strong. And he is, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, primarily because of chapter nine, when he says, my tears are flowing. I think that like taps, they don't turn off as he grieves over the sins of his people and the pain that is coming upon them. And yet, when you get to later in the book of Jeremiah, <clears throat> he's interjecting another tone. And you'll see that in the passage tonight in Jeremiah 31, where, where God is, continues to affirm his love for his people and his desire to bless them and to be good to them and be compassionate to them. So that, that's important to note that, that God isn't, doesn't delight in judgment. He wants to cleanse and forgive. Listen to the words of the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to light on verse 3, but I want to begin at verse 1. Jeremiah 31, at that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. <clears throat> Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness <clears throat> to you. And then he goes on to describe how God will bless his people because they are his people. I love verse 31, words of God referring to his relationship to his people in the Old Testament. By the way, I love that line in verse 2 when he speaks of the people surviving the sword and finding grace in the wilderness. Isn't that a great line, finding grace in the wilderness? And the wilderness for Israel was indeed a punishment for disobeying and disbelieving God. And yet, when you read about the 40 years that God ministered to his people in the wilderness, you come to see that God was very gracious to them. Uh, when they got out, uh, the Lord said, you know, your shoes didn't wear out. And, uh, I gave you manna to eat. I, I, I brought water out of the stone and I provided for my people. It was indeed a gracious experience in the wilderness by God's people. Speaking of the people of God, uh, really as if uh, the people, the nation is a man, verse 3 says, the Lord appeared to him from far away. And this is what God says to his people. I have loved you with an everlasting love. There are, therefore, I have continued my faithfulness or loving kindness, if you have the NASB. Uh, I'm not sure what the NIV translation is for that. Loving kindness. I like that word. I think that's a good translation of that Hebrew word. The ESV translates that faithfulness. So as, as God, who's been warning his people over and over and over about their sin, about his coming judgment, now is saying something to his people that he wants them to understand. And that is this, God's judgment 
for his people is not, nor will it ever be, the final chapter of his relationship with them. God never takes his people and, and, and judges them to the degree and to the extent that there is no hope left for them. In fact, the, the judgment God brings is more of a discipline, which is the thought of Hebrews 12 in the New Testament, whom I love, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines because it's remedial, it's restorative, it's redemptive. It's meant to bring you home. It's meant to bring you back in line. It's meant to bring correction so that God can bless you again. God delights in blessing us as we follow and obey him. So here he wants his people to understand that he has never stopped loving them. The way he says it in verse 3 is, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It's an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness or my loving kindness to you. There are three things I want to say about this. That is, it's as true to us as it is to Israel in the context of this passage. Number one is the characteristics of God's love for his people, his everlasting love for his people. The first of which is very simply this. It is a love that begins with God himself. God is proactive with his love. He takes the initiative to love. You remember the words of, of John in his first epistle in the New Testament. Uh, we love him because what? He first loved us who started the love that we have with god he did he's proactive god is not sitting there waiting for someone to figure it out fall in love with him and if we go to him say lord we've we want to love you now he goes well i've been waiting on you now i'll love you back no that's not how this works god loves us from the foundation of the world and he chose us that the only reason we can love him is he first loved us and manifested that love redemptively in christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, by his saving grace, bringing us into a state of being where we are born again and can love him back. That love is proactive. God takes the initiative, which adds a second characteristic of that love. It's absolutely free. Now, that sounds weird to say, particularly if you live through the 60s, like I did, where it was common, people commonly talked about free love. <laughs> Okay. I'm not talking about that kind of love like they were talking about. But God's love is free, which means what? You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's free. God didn't have to love you, but he chose to love you. Did you know if God sent me to hell, there was nothing wrong that he would have done? If he punished me, if he squashed me like a bug, I would have no complaint because God would have been just in doing so. God doesn't have to love me, but he does. Why? He wants to. He chooses to. It's free love. It's love that comes from him. It's costly love. It cost him his dear son, did it not? <laughs> it sent him to the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a costly love, but it's free to me. It's a surprising love. Now, I don't know. My wife is here, and, and I don't want her to answer this question or, or comment, but if you really knew me, probably like she knows me, you wouldn't love me very much. You'd see all my warts. You'd see all my stubborn. Do you know I'm stubborn? Did you know I'm hard-headed? Did you know I'm moody? Uh, did you know that sometimes I just, I just get a burr under my saddle? Do you know what I mean by a burr under the saddle? And I'm just grumpy all day. I know none of you are ever like that. But I am. I forget things. I make promises that I forget to keep. You wouldn't like me very much. 
Why does God love me? I'm suggesting to you that nobody deserves God's love, but it's surprising that he loves us nonetheless. And may I suggest strongly that the fact that he loves us because we are the way we are is to his glory and to his honor. It praises him. It's a covenantal love. It's a salvific love. It's a promise and a covenant he took, he made with me to love me no matter what I do or what I am. He will love me. And he loves me. He chose me. I am his. It is obviously an everlasting, enduring, never-ending love, as indeed verse 3 states clearly. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That echoes, does it not? Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, where Paul goes to great pain to say, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he goes down the list, and the list is pretty concerning. Sometimes it's pain, sometimes it's sickness. If I'm sick, does that mean God doesn't love me? No. Misfortune, hardship, criticism, affliction, abandonment, rejection. If the worst happens, has that separated me from God's love? Romans 8 says, no, nothing will separate me from God's love. God's love overcomes all barriers and it never ends. By the way, that's the basis of 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, which says love endures all things. How can we say that in a human love? Because it's God's love that he gives to us. It's transformative. It changes my life. It motivates me. It inspires me. As Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ constrains me, compels me, motivates me to go to church and worship and sing and praise God and thank him for loving me in spite of who and what I am. These are the characteristics of God love, God's love. Does that encourage anybody? That is what love really looks like. The characteristics of his love. Second, the faithful action. Now, we're not only seeing the characteristics of it, but the deeds of God's love. God loved. Did you know the word love can be both a noun and a verb? Love is action sometimes. Love is what you do, not just how you feel. How does God's love act? It acts in a trustworthy, dependable, and faithful way. That's why ESV and NIV, trans, not the NIV, I'm sorry, maybe other translations, translate the last line in verse 3 about his, his loving kindness. I have continued my faithfulness to you. His loving kindness, his kindness to us because of his love is faithful. I can count on it. It's dependable. People are not dependable, but God is. People are not trustworthy, but God is. God's love acts in every, situ every situation of life where in such a way I can depend upon him to do what is right, which reminds us that God's love not only is trustworthy, but it's wise. It, it's wise. It's good. It makes all kinds of good decisions. I know our children have a hard time understanding this, but a Snickers bar before dinner is not a wise choice to make. Uh, mama says, hey, I told you. Pastor said that. that, that it's not sin. It's just not wise. But God makes wise decisions. God doesn't say to us, what would you like for me to do? By the way, nothing gets me more riled up than a theology that teaches we tell God what we want God to do for us. Man, that irritates the fire out of me. Who's the boss here? God or me? God doesn't open the door and say, just tell me what you want. You'll have it. He's not a genie in a lamp. What kind of a deal is this? A wise prayer is a prayer that says, Lord, this is 
this is what I think I need, and this is what I'm going to ask you for. But before I'm finished praying, I want you to know, if I didn't pray right, ignore what I said and give me what I should have said. That's why I was praying. Because God never gives anything but what's best. That's his love. He chooses to give us that which is wise. He corrects us when we need correcting. Forgive me. I know I quote my mom a lot. But the older I get, the more I think of what she would say to me when she would discipline me. And I deserved every time she disciplined me and I hated it. She said, I love you too much to let you get away with that. <laughs> God says, I love you too much, John, to let you get away with that. I'm going to put a harness on you and you're going to hate me for it and love me for it later. Why? Because I love you. Because if you keep walking down this path of sin, it will destroy you. And I will not let that happen. That's God's love. God's love acts in wisdom. God's love acts righteously and with purity. God cannot lead us to do or do in our lives that which is in violation of his holy will and law. Everything God does with us, for us, and to us is righteous in every respect. God's love acts unchangingly, immutably. It doesn't waffle here or there. It doesn't diminish or increase. It is constant. It is all sufficient. It acts sufficiently in every respect. If everybody in this world hates my guts, but God loves me. That's all I need. And it protects us. It cares for us. In the most minute things, Jesus, in teaching about don't be anxious, would use the analogies of birds and flowers. You are worth more to the heavenly father than a sparrow and yet when a sparrow falls to the ground the father knows and cares about that he knows your needs he cares about your needs his love for you is just that precise he will give you clothing he will give you covering for look at the flowers god clothes them with beauty did you know god could have created in shades of gray or black and white. All the flowers pop out. Now, those are pretty gray flowers. Yeah, but they're a little dark. I'd like some lighter shades of gray. Springtime, I know we're not seeing a lot of growth, but boy, the springtime when things are popping, if you see a field of wild, wild flowers, the color is almost eye popping. The hues and shades and it's almost like they're praising God who creates with such beautiful color. That's the action of a loving God. <clears throat> That's God's faithful action. So we've seen his characteristics, his faithful action. Let me add thirdly, our response to his love. Love demands response relationship even though you don't have a clear forthright statement of what they're to do in response to the love of god i think there is housed within what is said here in chapter 31 of jeremiah an inherent guidance as to what god is looking for notice he starts out in verse one that when he operates redemptively in the history of his people he said i will be their God, and they will be my people. Don't you hear relationship there? Don't you hear loving, uh, a, a loving uh, uh, response back to God? Well, isn't that what in the New Testament we are told repeatedly? What are the two great commandments? The first is this, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God wants you to love him back. As Jesus is preparing the disciples for his departure, he keeps speaking repeatedly about two things, among others, 
love God and love each other. Our love is, is an echoed response of a transformed heart of people who once were selfish and only thought about ourselves. Now think about our God and think about each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our response should be grateful. Gratitude is a is a, a sign that someone gets it. By the way, if, if people live in sin, they're never grateful. They're never grateful. It's never enough. You give them some, you should give them more. That They want more. What you gave is not enough. Gratitude. God, I'm so thankful. I, I am so thankful. I'm not, this is a rhetorical question. Don't answer it. When was the last time you just prayed for three minutes? thanking God for how good he's been to you. May I suggest to you that is a heart enlightening experience. Just start and whatever comes to mind, just express it in prayer to God. God, I slept last night. I slept well last night. The night before I couldn't sleep. My body wouldn't relax. I just, my mind kept waking up. And when I'd wake up, I think about stuff I have to do. Has anybody ever been there? And once I start thinking about things I got to do and things I need to see to and things I need to correct, I need, then I'm thinking, I'm not, I'm supposed to be sleeping. What's your problem here? And all day yesterday, my brain was mush. Last night, I slept well, slept hard. Thank you, God, for sleep. Thank you, God, for renewal. Thank you, God, for sunshine. We could use a little more rain, but we thank you for the rain we got. Thank you for friends. Thank you for people that love me. Thank you for people that I can love. Thank you, Lord, for giving me lungs to breathe your air, the eyes to see what you have created here, and two legs to get up and walk. Oh, and God, thank you for Jesus and for what you've done for me and him. Well, you get started, man. Woo-hoo, it's good stuff. And for you long, you're, you're singing Gene Geisler's songs, thanking the Lord, so grateful to him. Gratitude, praise, and worship. Um, I was going to make a little quip, but I won't do that. I come to church on Sunday, not because I'm paid to come to church. I, if I weren't paid to come to church, I'd come to church anyway. Because I think God deserves my worship. I ought to get myself up and get down there and say to God, I'm here to thank you for being my God. I got a headache. I don't feel good. I'm tired. I'm grumpy, and I don't like most of the people here. That was not real there. But I'm here. I'm here. Because I want you to know I'm happy to belong to you and you are so great and glorious is that not our response one more response loving him grateful to him praise and worship him don't forget him don't neglect him don't forget him how often do i just Forget God till I need him again. <laughs> you know what they call that? A spare tire. Do you ever thank somebody for your spare? When was the last time you even thought about your spare tire? Oh, last time I was checking the air in it. Okay. Well, I'll think about God when I need him. And when I get what I got, what I need, I'm done with God for a while. And how is that a proper response to the God who has loved you with an everlasting love? And that love has faithfully given his kindness to you. Say, so you seem a little grumpy tonight, Pastor. Maybe, maybe that can be sanctified a bit. I see a lot of people who just don't care much. And it bothers me. And they don't care much about God. And that really bothers me. 
And they make little things, big things, and use that as a justification for not doing right. And that really, really, really bothers me. Be accountable to God. Take responsibility for yourself. And let's do the thing we ought to do. Why? Because we are loved with an everlasting love. And thus he is faithfully ministering to us. Let's live in the light of that. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, how can I imagine that before the echoes of time itself, you knew my name. You chose me to be your own. God of heaven, help us to live in the light of your choice of us. And thank you. That choice is not a choice of punishment, a choice of judgment. That is a choice of love that manifests kindness, loving kindness and faithfulness to us. Help us to respond to you in the way that pleases you and shows you that we love you back. We're happy to belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.